your point you make that it, doing it in a hospital setting, I think, makes more sense because um, not just for safety, but uh, but also because I'm not sure it should be given during withdrawal. That's when it is being given. Mm -hmm. And I think withdrawal just, we have, you know, there are other treatments which we have given for opiate uh, uh, users, which have also been toxic in withdrawal. You know, people, you know, withdrawal is a serious medical problem. So, you know, you, you know, they're ill, they're physically and str struggling. So I think adding a, a burden to someone who's in withdrawal is not a sensible idea. So, so my thinking is that if, once, if we can restore a sensible balance with ibogaine, we could potentially use it. But also, I'm, I'm very interested in using other psychedelics, as I think the fundamental principle is likely to be the same between ibogaine or psilocybin or DMT in addictions. You're disrupting these these overlearned, these persistent patterns of over-attention and over uh, increased, you know, enhanced love for, for, for drugs. You can perhaps break down those habit circuits and then allow people to escape. Meaning that things like the default mode network? Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, yeah, our current thinking about how psychedelics might be used in psychiatry is, is, to, is built from this you know, remarkable finding that you know, the, psych, what's, the psychedelic state is a state which is where you have completely disrupted the default mode network. This is the network in the brain which, in which your, your main sense of self, the, the core of you is in the default mode network. And, uh, and embedded in that, of course, is whether you are, you know, your, your depressive thoughts or whether your love objects, you know, your, your heroin addict, anything that's really related to you is embedded in the default. And, and how, how, how innate is that uh, versus how, uh, how formed is that? Well, the, the default mode network, I think, exists in children and, and babies. And it, it's, it is what you are. It is the part of the brain in which where you encode yourself your self-referential memories, your plans, your, you know, your retrospect, you know, looking back, looking forward, putting every, it is where you are. We know that if you know, if you damage the frontal part of the default mode network, your personality changes, you damage the posterior part of the default mode network, you kind of, you become a very strange person who, who really struggles with coordination and integration. So the default mode network is a fundamental part that, of orchestrating what you are. Um, but, in, in that, of course, are all the things that you have been. So in the, the default note network coordinates your access to good memories, to bad memories, to, to use of drugs, to resisting the use of drugs, etc. But uh, in a very simplistic way, the sort of current thought thinking is that, that some elements of the default mode become uh, misaligned or, or, or malignantly over-engaged with negative thinking and depression or uh, compulsive attitude to the seeking of drugs in drug use uh, and if we can disrupt those with psychedelics then potentially people can kind of restore a normal balance in that network and then and have a more rational approach you know a less a less a less determined so so the brain is kind of determining things like addiction and, the, and even though people don't want to use the drugs they often find themselves doing it even though they don't want to because their brain is kind of driving them that way and we're going to come back and talk about the impact of psilocybin on the, on the default mode network. But, but I guess to your point, this might be one of the ways in which ibogaine or iboga kind of help rewire a brain uh, for an individual who is opioid addicted, which is in and of itself kind of an interesting thing, isn't it? In that there's, there's got to be a genetic susceptibility to this because there are many people who take tons of opioids during, you know, say a post, you know, post-operative recovery from surgery and, you know, they take tons of the stuff. And then when they have to stop it, they stop it. And that's the end of it. And yet there are other people for whom that's not true. So do we have a sense of what that, what that genetic susceptibility looks like? And is it more importantly, is it, is it possible to predict that a priori so that we would understand, Hey, this is a person who is at such high risk for opioid dependency that even if they have to get their wisdom teeth pulled out, we are not giving them this medication. We're going to come up with a totally different pain management strategy. Yes, theoretically, it's unlikely to be in the genes. Oh, well. Uh, it's probably polygenic, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's not going to be a gene. Um, what, what, what do we know about why people become addicted? Well, we know, uh, we know that social factors are hugely important. You know, I mean, if you've seen The Wire, then you know that uh, downtown Baltimore. I lived The Wire. You live well, I mean, I did okay, my residency well, that, in Baltimore, so I, so I, I know, took care I mean, of the patients in the wire. Yeah. 
It's a frightening place, isn't it? I, I mean, unbelievable. The book, The Corner, which The Wire was based on, was the book I, once I matched to do my residency in Baltimore, a friend of mine who was a year ahead of me in at medical school who had already now spent a year in Baltimore, I was like, hey, do you have any advice for what I can do to kind of get ready for, because I'm moving from Stanford to Baltimore. You can't go from <laughs> the most <laughs> posh place in the world to the least. And he said, um, his only piece of advice was he said, read The Corner, because it's, literally what you're going to be living in. And it will give you a great sense of empathy for the patients that you're going to be taking care of. Um, and it's a riveting book, which ultimately became a riveting series. Absolutely. And, and it, you know, I, a couple of years ago, I was on my way to Philadelphia from Washington to give a lecture. And as we pulled out of Baltimore, I was looking out the train window thinking, this, it's like a war zone. Is this Hiroshima? Because you know, the downtown board, you know, I hadn't realized quite how destroyed it had been. And if you're living there and you've got no job, I mean, and the only thing you can do is deal drugs. You take drugs and you deal drugs. Absolutely. So, so a, a lot of drug use addiction comes because that's the one way people can actually achieve both a sense, something that takes away the misery of their lives, but also in a way, if they become drug dealers, becomes some, a, a role. So, so coping with Life stress is one reason people use drugs. But there are some people, you know, and they're very, you know, do you know, the rich, successful people and um, who, who still use opiates and get, and get into problems with opiates. And um, the example, I, I, I give two examples of this, two, two Oscar winners. Tatum O'Neill, youngest ever Oscar winner, marries the best, greatest tennis player in my career there's maybe ever been. You know, got two wonderful kids, lives you know, the life that everyone envies. You know, she's famous, beautiful, everything there. But when she comes out of heroin treatment, she says, the only time I felt whole was on heroin. And I, you see that, I see that with patients, not just heroin patients, I see it with alcoholics. There are plenty of people for whom alcohol makes them what they want to be. Mm. And only when they're drunk that they're actually functioning normally. And it, and why that is, we don't know. And actually, one of the interesting things, you know, that I, and the reason I want to study psychedelics, because I'm wondering whether, whether that gap that can only be filled by drugs could actually be kind of refilled or at least remodeled with psychedelics. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so that's another. And then, of course, there are, there are people who, who get, you know, who use drugs to get high and then they find somehow that the, the heart, their brain becomes sensitized to the drug use so that they, you know, they lose control. And that's a more classic with people who use cocaine or, or crystal. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.